It is literally in the curriculum, mm -hmm. teaching the kids which learning style they have. Mm -hmm. But I have a question. You have to teach this. This is what you have to teach. And I tell you, so it's easy for visual learners. I mean, there is it. Boom, douche. That's Africa. And there are all the countries. It's easy. So now I raise my hand and I go, ah, oh, ma'am. I'm a kinesthetic learner. How must I learn that? <laughs> must I put my backpack? And you say, right, to Egypt. And then there we go. <laughs> I'm just asking because I'm kinesthetic most. I'm kinesthetic. Now, how do you want me to learn a picture? A map. And I can also have that atlas. Atlas, that helps visualizing it. But again, it's very visual. Like, how am I touching the continent? Like, I want to play with it. You know? Yes. When you teach kids, in most cases, they still haven't found themselves. They don't know what type of learners they are. They are still finding themselves. So, maybe, yeah, it's debatable to say uh, we must teach them as according to their styles. But I also thought it was a fact that I should raise my hand when you said it's an effect on me, I said it's a fact. Because, we, <laughs> because I think as they find themselves, not necessarily for us to teach them according to their learning styles, but as they start, they discover, oh, this is how, you only realize when you are sometimes even out of school. To say, that oh, you prefer actually, I am a kinesthetic learner. We teach this in grade eight. But for most of those learners, it's just a subject that they don't understand. <coughs> they don't understand the practicality of them. So, to me, it could be both a fact and a Okay, so I'm, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Yes, ma'am. I'm just I think it's a method. You know, we are all a little bit of everything. Yes. But to find that it can be stronger. One I like that. Dominance or preference? Those two yeah. work like it. Yeah. Yeah. I saw another hand going up there somewhere. Yes, ma'am? Uh, I think that's why we are using different techniques when we are teaching, so that we can have our own choices. Okay. Yes, okay. Uh, the lady has just said, because the, the learners are still uh, trying to find themselves, whether they are poetry um, or the uh, usual ladies. So, yeah. They can't just say, no, I want to see I want to hear the culture say you want to change you. That's why we are using different techniques of teaching them, bringing in the, the teaching aids, different teaching aids, so that even the one that's needs touching may do the experiments. Okay, so that's so that's why I've said it's a, it's a fact that we have different techniques that. I still have a challenge for you guys. I, I want you to get to the same conclusion and I'll get to without telling you the conclusion. Right. Close your eyes. Close your eyes, everybody, don't cheat. I can see when you're cheating. So. <laughs> okay, now, I'm teaching the map of Africa, right? Okay, if you think, you're now, you close, uh, your eyes have to stay closed, just think a little bit to your left. Think to your left and up. Left and up. There's the, no, no, some more left. Uh, more left, left, upper, up. Ah, oh, guys, I'm trying to teach you Namibia. Why aren't you focusing on Namibia? I told you most. Left and up. Okay, open your eyes. Guys, if auditory learners were to only learn in an auditory way, how will they get that map in their head? So here's what I'm telling you the research suggests. What you are teaching, the content that you are teaching should dictate the method. Yeah. Not the children. Mm -hmm. The content dictates. Yeah. I want you all to become swimmers. I can tell you how to swim until I'm blue in the face. You will not be a swimmer until you swim. So the content dictates how you teach, not the preference of the child. 
So yes, we do have preferences. All of us have preferences. I prefer to not have to run somewhere. <laughs> Doesn't mean I can't run. Same thing with learning. If, it, if there's a picture, but I'm an auditory learner, the content says I will learn better by using the picture. Are we, are we on the same page now? Yes. So that is great relief for somebody who felt like they had to teach for all the different learning styles. Yeah. Because people were just inventing learning styles. Somebody said something about kids who learn through smell. Uh -uh. <laughs> Say do tell, how do I teach math now? No. <laughs> okay, fact or myth? This one, is, this one is quite important because I will explain a teaching tip afterwards that costs zero money, only effort. Okay, yes. Yeah, so also so I was going to get what you just said. So I guess that you're saying like the learning style is dependent on the content that you have. Or would I be wrong if I say depending also on the subject, because there are certain subjects that require you to be more of a like teacher. I don't know, which will be auditory and kinetic, I don't know. Yes, I think certain subjects lend themselves to more pictures. Certain subjects lend themselves to music, for instance. It's, it's just that how that subject works. But I don't think we can dismiss in any way that we can teach math using pictures or auditory uh, elements or whatever. So how it works within the brain, you make it stickier. If I could use a layman term by calling it stickier. If I just tell you something, you may forget it. But if you're doing it with me and I create an experience, you're using your whole brain and it's stickier, it's more likely that you're creating a better pathway than if I was just instructing you. So there's no, there's no single right answer for how to teach something. I, I really do believe you should just absorb as much knowledge from everyone and go, I've been teaching this for 20 years and I thought I figured everything out. I thought accounting would never be done with pictures. And somebody just showed me a way to incorporate pictures. So yes, certain subjects lend themselves better to certain methods, but I want to challenge everybody to challenge the idea of what you thought your subject does. Answer your question? Okay, great. More questions, ladies and gentlemen. Nothing? I'm, I'm hearing or I'm looking and I'm seeing a bit of a question on the face. <laughs> I wanted to ask the previous um, because you just asked a question, but you say if you teach a learner how to swim, you must you must let that learner swim again practically so that he understands. But now I'm trying to get the answer to what you said about that. Oh, how would you teach a map of Africa to auditory learners? You will teach it exactly the same way you teach it to kinesthetic learners and to visual learners yeah. with a map. Teaching somebody about a map. You show them the map. <coughs> yeah. So obviously, the richer the experience, if we had the money and we could all walk around Africa, the kids would never ever forget the map of Africa. But let's be realistic. <laughs> Teaching a map, the best way is to use the map. Okay. Um, students' attention span is constant throughout my lesson. So when they walk in, versus the middle, versus the end. If they don't walk in listening, then they walk out also not listening. That's just how it is. Is that true? False? I want to ask a question. Yes. What's the difference false between the and the mouth? So, shoo. That is like a very philosophical question. <laughs> because I can think about this forever. A myth is a unicorn because it simply just doesn't exist versus I can tell you my shirt is blue and that's a straight lie. But it's also a myth because it really isn't blue. But I wanted to say, everyone is not just, it's not a fact, it's not a myth, but it's a lie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I like that. It's a straightforward lie. Do you guys agree? Okay. So this is called the primacy and recency effect put onto a bit of a, a, 
a table, not really a table, a graph, that's the word I'm looking for, a graph. So quickly tell me, when your kids walk into the class, what's the first thing you do? Register. I heard it register quite obviously. You greet them, what else? <laughs> you shout at them. They got their guns back Engaging a child 
grabbing a Generation Z child, and I challenge you guys to go Google it. There's a lot about Generation Z. Go find out how to capture their attention. It looks different. It really is different. And as teachers, you all have growth mindset. I know this. And you're never going to stop learning, so you're going to Google it. But the point I'm trying to make is attention. Without that, without passing through that first gate, you're not going to have learning. So the moment it passes through the gate of attention, it goes into something called the working memory. Everybody heard about the working memory before? Working memory? Yeah. Working memory is like a traffic circle. Okay? It can only handle between five to nine new bits of information. Let's say I use five big words you don't understand and you've never heard in your life. It's like you're stopping the learning process right there. Because my brain is going, uh, 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 uh. don't know what she's saying. But aren't you now going into the mind, the fixed mindset yourself? So this is the physical capacity of the brain. I'll, I'll explain now what helps the assist the working memory. But for everyone, those five to nine new bits of information is sort of where it stops before it can go to long-term memory. Long-term memory has capacity like super capacity. But that's why we stagger an approach. That's why when you fill in your lesson plan, you'll say, this is linking to existing knowledge. What existing knowledge am I linking this to? Because something moves from my working memory to long term when I can link it. So if I'm talking about Pythagoras to my kids, and you see the blank faces, and they're like, hmm? <laughs> but then I link it to 90 degree triangles. There's a link. Even though it doesn't explain comp uh, Pythagoras completely, a link has been created, and now they can go, okay, I know 90 degree triangles, so we can figure this one out. Okay, we're going with that. But if I carry on and I go, uh, Pythagoras, nothing but triangles, congruency, and I start going, and this kid has never heard this information before. The kid that you think got, uh, the kids that you think got dumb, will go like, mm. and you're losing them because they don't know what you're talking about. So working memory, another limited capacity resource. We assist the working memory by putting things in place, like making sure we link it to um, existing knowledge. Uh, how often, when you get them in grade eight, they had four or five different teachers teaching them math. One teacher calls it a dingiki and a chutiki. So she's trying to help them by giving them easy language. She just calls it the dingiki and a chutiki. And the dingiki and the chutiki goes here, and then that dingiki and the chutiki goes there. <laughs> It helps the kids sometimes, but now there's another teacher who uses strict technical terms. She doesn't dingiki and hutaki there. So now the other teacher, she mixes it up, mixes it up a little bit. Got some of this, some of that, and then mix it up. Now all those kids come to your class in grade eight. You use strict technical terms. Because this is what you want them to know. The dingiki and the chutiki kids are sitting there going. <laughs> and we make the assumption that these kids don't, they just don't know. But they do know. They just don't know that dingiki and chutiki is the same as exponential law. So it's very important to link it there. Yeah. Anyway, okay, so you guys get the idea of working memory. Then it goes to long-term memory. And after that, the learning process, if you could think about your neuron, is recording. Going up and down, strengthening your neural pathway. Right. So what was the first gatekeeper? The first gatekeeper I should have got? Attention. So we just said that their attention is not the same throughout the class period. If it's depicted like that, it peaks at prime time one and then later again in prime time two. And I just told you, learning cannot happen without attention. So here are the kids, they're coming to my class and they're ready, they want to learn. I have their attention and I go, 
Emotion and cognition goes together, right? Here's the interesting fact though. A child who is bored in your class, a bored brain is under stress. If something is boring to you, your brain is not happy about that experience. So you want to have a balance in your class. Negative goes to your reactive brain. Reactive brain, we're going to do that. Now, how about a positive environment? Where I'm going, guys, we have a growth mindset here. I'm going to start asking you. We just spoke about the peaks at the beginning and at the end of a lesson. What was that called? What were those, call, uh, those peaks called? It has a specific name. Somebody said it. That one? Primacy and recency. Primacy at the beginning, recency at the end. Did you at all feel threatened by the question I just shared with you? This is where learning is conducive. It, it's, a con it's conducive to learning when I'm not threatening you. I am telling you this environment where we're going to learn. Learning is good. Learning is fun. And I know that I could learn a million things from everybody sitting in front of me because there's no way I've had the experiences or the education <coughs> or the skills that you guys have. So I'm always open to learning. And that makes it so easy to learn from me. Because I'm not standing here going, hmm. <laughs> a bunch of teachers, let me just help them out. Shine the sea stalk. I'm going to tell the church about this so that they know how good I did. I'm helping the teacher. <laughs> when someone is arrogant, it disrupts the learning process. It's an emotional thing for me. I'm not saying it's like that for everyone. For me, definitely like that. If you had to think back about the teachers who taught you, you have to have at least one that scared the out of you. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that in the church, but I feel like it's true. There is one that you I would rather, I will fake death. <laughs> Rather than not do that woman's homework. <laughs> now quickly think. When somebody instilled that type of fear, what did that teacher teach you? The something that she taught. Can you think back and remember good things about her lessons? No. 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 Do you want to be that teacher? No. Now think about a teacher. You love this teacher. This was this was your teacher. And then you think about what that teacher taught you. I can I had an English teacher and it was just like connected. She was never overly friendly or she never let my dis uh, discretion slide or in, like nothing. She was still strict. She still had her rules. She wasn't a pushover. But the way she taught Macbeth, guys, I can still quote Macbeth. <laughs> Lady Macbeth said, uh, false face must hide but the false heart doth know. Because I remember how she was like going at it, teaching me like that. <laughs> I have a love for languages, for poetry because of that woman. Do you want to be that teacher? Yeah. Yes. That's the teacher that I wanted to be. But her lesson also makes it easy. Literally, I have such... It makes it easier, but I can tell you now, and this is this is a secret from my from my own life. Um, I was a math teacher, and typically there's not much like what fun is there in math, guys. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> so for the most part, my kids were they loved me for what I could see. I mean, they didn't keep my car or anything, so we were fine, I guess. And then, having been teaching now for roughly five years. And you, you sort of forget how much you love your kids in a way. Like, I still know I love them a lot, but I kind of forgot. And um, I get a wedding invitation. So I'm like, oh, that's a good wedding invitation. Who's getting married? Makes me jealous because I'm not married. Anyway, let's open the wedding invitation. And I'm, I'm reading, and these are kids that I taught. So there's RSVP on there. And I'm thinking, I'm not even RSVP, but I'm putting it right now. Phone. 
okay, where are you in this world? What have you done? I mean, this child was so naughty. The fact that I didn't kill him. <laughs> it's amazing that he's allowed to live to the old enough age to get married. Where are you? What have you done with your life? I'm thinking, you know, if he has a job as a gardener somewhere, I'm proud because he's there. I'm proud. He goes, ma'am, I studied to be a lawyer. And I was like, they let you in. Are you And then he said, I remember the math you taught me and that's fine, but you taught me that if you do something wrong, there will be consequences. And the consequences don't mean I don't love you. The consequences came with the action. And that inspired me to become a lawyer so that people can be held responsible for their actions. Sure. And I was like, it's not all about the math. <laughs> there is a lawyer. I hope he specializes in parking tickets. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, everything I taught you, we're doing a course for students as well called Learning Hacks. Oh, that slide just went nowhere. We also do it for educators. This was just a snippet that I showed you. But I still saw a question over there. Sir? Can you go back to this? I was trying to look at this and uh, emotion and pain, but if I have to sum up, we can all agree. My, my summary about all this will be saying teacher's attitude. Yes. So, but if I say teacher's attitude, would it not be better if we say emotion in teaching instead of learning? So, when we, we work with a lot of people who do research, and often we talk about the power in uh, language, like the language that we use, and that's why I emphasize it when somebody says something like potential or... So, I do think that uh, putting the emphasis on teaching is good for teachers. But somewhere along the line, I think people have forgotten that there is a lot of responsibility that comes with learning too. And that's why I, I sort of want emotion and learning for everybody to acknowledge that my learning is my responsibility. The teacher facilitates it, but the teacher, they can do whatever they want to. That does not mean learning will take place for me. And, and that's why I would prefer, even though I agree with you, so I'm not disagreeing, I definitely like learning. It's my emotion and my learning that I'm responsible for. Okay, ladies and gents. That's my story. Wow.